I was sitting there thinking that a few years ago, when I had just come as pastor, Brother George was leading our worship, and I remember he got up before the message and he sang the love of God. And Brother George, do you remember, it took me about five minutes to get myself together. I bawled like a whiny baby. God was all over you that day, and he was all over that song that day. And it had such a great meaning. I want to speak to you this morning about something that's abused, a word that's abused probably more than any other. And that is the word love. It's used in so many different vernaculars. It's stretched into so many different segments that anymore we don't really understand what love is, what it really means, what its purpose was set out to be. It's an abused word. Sometimes we use the word love to get something we want. We tell someone we love them enough, we think that's going to provide what we want. Sometimes we use the word love to cover a multitude of indiscretion. Sometimes we use the word love and it's used in a vernacular that displays some kind of physical interaction. That's not love. God's Word tells us about love. Jesus Christ taught us love. God's Word gave us the Ten Commandments, and the Ten Commandments are the basic moral precepts and concepts of morality that we should live by. But Jesus Christ came to this earth, and when He did, He took all ten of those commandments, and He shrunk them down to just two. In Matthew chapter 22, Jesus condensed these down to love for God and love for your neighbor. And he told us, when he gave us that word of advice and information and inspiration, that in love for God and in love for our neighbor were all of the commandments fulfilled. A person that loves God will not abuse God's name. A person who loves God will never place anything before God or ahead of God. A person who loves God will not forget God's day, the Lord's day in his house. A person who loves their neighbor will not lie to them. A person who loves their neighbor won't steal from them, they won't cheat them, and they won't violate their marriage. True love always does good, it never does evil. Love for our neighbor and love for our brother and our sister in society today is rare. We live in a selfish society. Everything is all about me, 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 my, 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 I, I, I. We have very little of that love that God wanted us to portray one to the other for our neighbor. It was a story of a mother that lived in an apartment complex. And she had a little corner grocery store just down the street from where the apartment complex was. One day, as her child was sleeping in the bed in the apartment, mom needed to dart down to the store and get a half gallon of milk. So she thought, it'll be okay, the baby's asleep, and I'll just run down there and get the milk, and I'll be right back. And as she got down to the grocery store, all of a sudden she heard siren. She looked up, and a fire truck was coming down the street, and the thought came into her mind, boy, I hope that's not my apartment. I hope it's not our building. She quickly got her milk, grabbed it, and headed back to the apartment complex, and she could see the smoke. And she could see more fire trucks as they were gathering around, and it was her apartment building. And she began to get frantic, and she cried, My baby's in there! My baby's in there! Someone's got to get my baby! And the fire chief ran over and grabbed her and tried to console her, and he said, Ma'am, it's too late! 
It's too late. The building is gone. We can't stop it. The mother was crying frantically and said, Please help my baby. Help my baby. One of the young firemen who had just been on the force stepped up. He said, Chief, wait a minute. I've got a baby at home. And if it was my baby, I'd want somebody to save my baby. He said, Chief, let me go. Chief said, son, you know the danger. He said, I do. He said, go ahead. The young fireman ran into the apartment building, ran up the stairs, got into the room, secured the baby, went to the window, pitched the baby out the window into the safety net that the firemen were holding below. But just as the baby safely landed in the fire net, the floor gave way underneath the fireman, and he was killed. Fast forward 20 years into the future. And a young lady is standing in front of a grave. And there's a monument there to a fireman. She's standing quietly. And a man comes by in the cemetery and notices her and says, Young ladies, was that your father? She said, No, no, it wasn't my father. I said, well, is, is it your son? She said, no. It wasn't my son. She turned and looked at the man and said, this is the man that died for me. What a powerful story. What a powerful story of God's love for you and for me. That his only begotten son wasn't taken to a cross. He wasn't held down to a cross. He willingly laid down his life for you and for me, and we're alive today. I want to speak to you this morning on a tale of two loves. Let's turn in our Bible to Luke chapter 10. I'll be reading verses 25 through 37. There's part of this scripture, hopefully you know all the scripture, but there's part of this scripture that you should really be aware of because it talks about the good Samaritan. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said unto him, What is written in the law? How readest thou? And he answering said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy strength and with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. And he said unto him, Thou hast answered right. This do, and you shall live. But he, willing to justify himself, said unto Jesus, And who, exactly who, is my neighbor? I'm going to pause there for a moment. Because, you know, sometimes we have trouble deciding who our neighbor is. We're willing to help some neighbors, and we're willing to overlook other neighbors, aren't we? So now, the young man is questioning Jesus and saying, <laughs> who is my neighbor? Jesus answering said, a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment and wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. And by chance there came down a certain priest that way, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. And likewise a Levite, when he was at the place, came and looked on him and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him. And he went to him, and he bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, and set him on his own beast, and brought him to an inn, and took care of him. And on the morrow, when he departed, he took out two pence, and gave them to the host, and said unto him, Take care of him, and whatsoever thou spendest more when I come again, I will repay thee. Which now of these three, thinkest thou, was a neighbor unto him that fell into the thief? And he said, he that showed mercy on him. And then Jesus said, 
Go thou and do likewise. Jesus Christ is love. Jesus Christ is the incarnation of love. Jesus Christ is the facilitator of love. Without Him, we have no baseline. Without Him, we have no reference. Jesus loves us. Jesus suffered for us. Jesus has prepared for you and me. Jesus died for us. He was buried for us. He rose again, and He's coming back. Because he loves us. So today we investigate a tale of two loves. In this passage of scripture that we've just read, the first thing we notice, and I want everyone, here's something guaranteed to get an amen this morning. I may not do anything else, but I'm going to get an amen here. You ready? My message this morning only has two points. And all the people said... Amen. I got some sub points. Just thought I'd, you know, throw that in there. The other thing this morning is, anybody had trouble with allergies this week? Oh, my eyes have been terrible. Yesterday my left eye was totally closed. I have to warn you, I, I'm seeing double. So that means I got twice as many notes as I would normally have. A tale of two loves. The first thing I notice in this passage of Scripture is a love for God. God is not just somebody that we worship. He is someone that we know personally that we should have an intimate relationship with, and that means we can share our deepest thoughts, our fears, our aspirations, our hopes, our dreams, our failures. We can share them all with Him. Because in loving God, that means we love Him passionately. In verse 27 it says, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart. All of your heart. That shows a heart of emotion. In times of laughter, in times of sorrow, in times of rejoicing, in times of fear, I can passionately come to Jesus. And I can love him with a heart of emotion. True love always responds with emotion. It relies upon enthusiasm. It regards expression. But in this passage of Scripture, it's not only telling us that we need a heart of emotion, it's letting us know that we need to have a heart that's exclusively His. I'm married to my sweet, darling, beautiful, wonderful wife. I love her with all my heart. And she loves me because she puts up with me. But I want you to know there are some things that I hold exclusively for my wife. There are feelings that I have exclusively for my wife. There are certain things I will do exclusively with my wife. There are certain things that I would only say exclusively to my wife. We should have a heart of exclusivity when it comes to our love for God. There are things that should be sacred between the bonds of that relationship that we have with Jesus Christ. Much the same as we have with our spouse. Spiritual loyalty. To Jesus Christ. We need to love him passionately, but we also need to love him personally. Verse 27 says, with all thy soul. I was thinking about the message this morning, Brother Woody, and I couldn't remember the song, but there's somebody that does a song that says, withholding nothing, withholding nothing. We should withhold nothing. 
We withhold nothing from our love with Jesus Christ. He withheld nothing for us. He went to the cross of Calvary for us. I need to love Him personally with all my soul. When the, God's Word uses the word soul, it's talking about our identity. The soul is where our personality resides. The soul is where our temperament is developed. The soul is where we express likes and dislikes and fears and anxiety. The soul is my identity. I need to love him personally. But the soul also speaks of intimacy. Soulmates communicate on a different level. All of our soul means all of our intimacy. Withholding nothing. Not frigid. We're free. My communication is open. I'm not worried about others. I don't care what they think about me. I'm genuine and I'm not phony. And if I want him to change me, I need to change my communication with him. I need to change my commitment to him. I need to change my concerns around him. I need to change my confidence in him. 1 John 1, 9 in the ESV says, If we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us of all of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 1 John 5, 14 and 15. This is the what? Confidence. This is the confidence that, toward, that we have toward Him. That if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the request that we ask of him. So I challenge you this morning, love him passionately. Love him personally. But we also need to love him profoundly. Verse 27 says, With all thy strength. Back to that song, withholding nothing. Withholding nothing. My Jesus, I love thee. I know thou art mine. He belongs to us and we belong to him. Love creates desire. Desire creates dedication. Dedication demands action. Action is expressed by giving. God loved us and he gave to us. John 3.16, I know Brother George likes John 3.17 the best. And it's good. But we can never get around John 3, 16, that he loved us so much that he gave. He gave his only begotten son. You can't live without giving, and you can't love without giving. Amen? Not successfully. God loved us, and he gave. God gave Christ. He gave us creation. He gave us Calvary. And he loved us with a cross. Larnell Harris wrote those words. By the way, a good way to make a lady fall in love with you is to be taking care of a Larnell Harris concert and take her over there. Won my wife right over. Larnell Harris wrote these words. He loved me with a cross. He loved me with a cross. In answer to the call of love, he loved me with a cross. We need to love him passionately, personally, profoundly, and we need to love him purposely. Look at verse 27. With all thy mind. It's crucial that we balance emotion with truth. Experience does not replace God's Word. There are people that are looking for some kind of experience and they're calling that love. But we need to love Him purposely and that means with all of our mind. I should never respond to God's wholehearted love half-heartedly. This text says some important words. This brief text that we read said, all thy heart, all thy mind. 
all thy strength. What part of all do we not understand? How can all be fractional? We can't love our children more than we love God. Ooh. We can't love our spouse more than we love God. We can't love our doctor or our lawyer or the government more than we love God. Yet I stand before you today and it pains me and it breaks my heart to tell you, and I'll get in trouble for this, I get phone calls, I get texts, so be it. The truth is the truth. When you know to be in God's house, and you know to be faithful, and you claim to love Him, and you claim to belong to Him, but you run scared because of what some doctor has said, or you run scared because of some pandemic or pandemic that the government has sent along, and you ignore God's Word, and you take their Word, your love is faulty. There's a problem. Something needs to be addressed in your life. Jesus didn't do that with us. Jesus loved us to the cross. Jesus loved us with His life. We need to love Him. We need to love Him passionately and personally and profoundly. We need to love Him purposefully. Until we learn how to love God in these ways, it's impossible for us to love our neighbor. The greater our response to God, the greater our response to each other. The greater our capacity to love God, the greater our capacity to love each other. The greater our devotion for God, the greater our devotion will be for our neighbor. Matthew 24, 12 says, Because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But 1 John 4.11 comes right along behind and says, Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. So this morning, my first point, love for God. But this is a tale of two loves. My second point, Love for others. If we're going to understand love, we need to understand the principle of love that Jesus is teaching in this passage of Scripture. Look at verse 27. It says, And thy neighbor as thyself. The principle of love is found in Matthew chapter 7 when it says, Therefore all things whatsoever ye would that men should do unto you, do ye even so unto them. When you have a hurt, you do whatever you need to do to heal it. When you have a responsibility, you fulfill it. When you have a prayer request, you pray about it. Amen? Amen? God's Word tells us that if we love like God intends us to love, that if we truly understand love, that I hurt just as much when you're hurting as when I'm hurting. That when I see you hungry, I'm just as bothered about it. I need to see you fed. I need to get you food. When there's something going on in your life that's awry, if I love the way I'm supposed to love as a Christian, I care just as much or more about your need as I do my need. That's the principle of love. That's what sets us apart as Christians. That's what's supposed to make a difference in our world. And if we show our world more of Christ's love, we'll receive more of the Father's love. Amen? Loving ourselves comes naturally. Loving somebody like Brother Woody, I have to work at. God is good. But you know, loving others can be tiring. It can be troubling. It can be treacherous. It can be trying. But perfect love always promotes perfect patience. I want you to think about this. And we don't know. We read God's Word and we have a general concept of what it's going to be like when we, when we get to heaven. 
But I believe that there's two questions that all of us are going to have to answer. When we stand before the judgment seat of God, and those two questions I believe are going to be, did you love God with all your heart? And did you love your neighbor as yourself? Because God's Word tells us that in those two are all of the commandments fulfilled. The principle of love. But we also have a parable of love in this passage. We find it in verses 30 through 34 when we find out about the Good Samaritan. And Jesus answering said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment and wounded him and departed, leaving him half dead. And by chance there came down a certain priest that way, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise a Levite, when he was at that place, came and looked on him and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him. And he went to him, and he bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, and set him on his own beast, and brought him to an inn, and took care of him. Now in that passage of Scripture, I think we see three attitudes. The first attitude we see is, what's mine is mine. And I'll keep it. Thank you very much. The second attitude that's expressed is, what's thine is mine, and I'll take it if I can. But the third attitude that we see expressed is, what's mine is thine, and you can have all of it you need. That's the third attitude. That's the attitude that Christ expects of us. Loving our neighbor requires acceptance. We have to accept them. And we come up with so much garbage as human beings to judge each other on. I'll love them if they don't have tattoos. I'll love them if they don't have piercings. I'll love them if the guy don't have long hair. I'll love them if they don't have holes in their jeans. On and on and on and on we go, making up all of these ridiculous rules and plain like they're religious. If I'm going to love my neighbor, it's going to require acceptance. They're not necessarily going to look like me. They're not going to act like me. They're not going to talk or walk like me. Thank God the world doesn't need another me. I'm glad the world made diversity. I'm glad God created diversity. We're different. We need to love each other and we need to accept each other. Just as we are. We don't have to clean up to come to God. Thank you, Lord. We come to Him, and He cleans us up. Amen? I don't care about social status, or whether they like me, or the color of their skin, or the length of their hair or their clothing. I don't care if they smell good or if they just smell. I'm supposed to accept them. CNN news reporter Peter Arnett wrote a book. And he shared a story in the book that he wrote. He was on site in Israel. And there was a terrorist bombing that took place. And members of the media, of course, have the opportunity to get into more secure locations than other people do. So he was in a very secure location that was up close and personal with the damage that had taken place. And Peter Arnett told the story about a man that came holding a little girl in his arms and crying, and she was bloodied. She had been battered by the bomb. And the man came to Peter Arnett and said, please, please get get her to a hospital. Please get her to a hospital now. And he thought, what what, what am I going to do? I, I do have my car, and I have a press credential on my car. I have a press pass. Maybe I can get her there that way. He said, come on, let's try. They got in his car and he made sure his press credentials were down in the windshield and drove as fast as he could to get to the hospital and they took the little girl in to the emergency room and they worked and they worked on her. But she died. And Peter Arnett said, 
the man was devastated and he was bawling and crying uncontrollably. And Peter Arnett went over to him and he put his arms around him and he said, Sir, I'm so sorry. I can't even imagine how it would feel to lose my daughter. The man looked up at him and said, That's not my daughter. I'm Israeli. She's a Palestinian girl from the settlement. But she's somebody's daughter. And somebody loved her. And I wanted to save her. That's the kind of love for our neighbor that we need to have. It goes beyond what we can see. It delves deep into the heart to what we cannot see. It becomes a part of our soul and our spirit. Peter Arnett said he would never, ever, ever be the same after that day. Loved ones, listen. We're all sons and daughters of God. And that's the attitude of acceptance that Jesus expects of us. So love requires acceptance. But loving your neighbor also requires affection. We find in verse 31 through 33, And by chance there came down a certain priest that way, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. And likewise a Levite, when he was at the place, came and looked on him and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion upon him. The priest came by and took a look. The religious man, who no doubt taught about love, he showed no concern. The Levite came along, who was one who helped in the temple with the task of the priest. Looked upon the man and only had curiosity. But here comes a Samaritan, and the Samaritan shows compassion. One was touched by need, but the other touched the need. He didn't need appreciation. He wasn't looking for attention. He didn't need accreditation. His love for others was not contingent upon the love he received from the other. I like to think of it as a kind of a Nike kind of love. You know that Nike love that just says, just do it. Just do it. We need to stop the mumbling and the grumbling and the garbage and the religiosity and just do it. Just love our neighbor. Just look for a need to fill. Look for a hurt to heal. Look for someone to lift up out of the bottomless pit. We need to get out of ourselves. And we need to get into others. When we learn to get out of ourselves and let God take our love, He will do astronomical, incredible things with it. He will change lives in a way that you could never imagine. The Nike kind of love. Just do it. Love requires acceptance, it requires affection. But also love requires action. We find it in verse 34. And he went to him and he bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, and set him on his own beast and brought him to an inn and took care of him. Another story I read was about the Special Olympics in Los Angeles. And the Special Olympics, of course, is a a great event that's sponsored every year. And they were getting ready to have the 50-meter race in the Special Olympics. And this reporter was talking about the sight it was to see these challenged people that were willing to get up there and compete. And they're lined up at the starting line, and the gun fires, and all of them take off, except for one boy that instead of taking off down the track, he saw some people he knew over on the side, and he just took off over to them. 
And he's over there having a hidey-ho time, just visiting with them. And there was a young Down syndrome young lady who was running in the race who looked over and saw him. And she paused and she said, Hey! Hey! Come back over here! Come back over here! The track! The track! The young man just continued to visit with his friend. So she went back on with the race, and she's running as hard as she can run. And as she turns the corner and she's headed toward the finish line, she cuts her eyes back over, and that boy is still standing over there visiting. She stopped, went over and took him by the arm, led him out onto the track, and they both walked down the track to the finish line together. Now they were in last place, but they finished together. Let me ask you something this morning. Is it important to you how you finish? Is it important to you that you finish together? And if we're going to finish together as people of God, we need to finish together with our God and do it His way. A tale of two loves. Love God. Love your neighbor. Do you love God? Do you love Him with all of your heart? With all of your mind? With all of your strength? Because I'll tell you right now, you can't love each other properly. You see, God put it in the right order. We must love God first. Then we understand how to love our neighbor and love our neighbor properly. God's love for us was proven for us at the cross. Romans 5, 8 says he commended his love toward us. While we were yet sinners, he died. Unfortunately, we have church members who won't even come to church for him, much less die for him. But they claim his name. They claim to belong to him, but they're not faithful. They're not fruitful in their work. They're not free in their love. They don't reach out and try to touch somebody else with his comfort. The priest in our story claimed to belong to God. But the love of God was many. The Levite claimed to serve God. But he wouldn't serve others. It's a tale of two loves. Now you know, if you know me, that sometimes I, I get really religious in the song side of things. And I bet you there's very few of you here this morning that's even going to know Mary McGregor. She actually sang back during the prehistoric days when I was writing, when I was growing up. But she had a little song that she sang. It said, Torn Between Two Lovers, feeling like a fool. And she ended it up with saying, loving both of them is breaking all the rules. Amen? You can't be torn between two loves. You either love him with all of your heart and with all of your mind and with all of your strength, or you love the world. If you love the world with all of your heart and with all of your mind and with all of your strength, the love of the Father is not in you. What is love? It's silence when what you say would hurt someone. It's patience when your neighbors curt with you. It's deafness when you hear gossip. It's thoughtfulness when you see someone else in trouble. It's promptness when duty calls. It's courage when misfortune calls. Have you accepted his love? Is it a part of your soul and your heart and your mind and your spirit? In 1965, Jackie DeShannon wrote a song. And that song I've heard over and over again in many different venues, but what I remember it for is there's a special documentary on the assassination of President Kennedy. And this song is so often used, 
in that documentary, and I've seen it over and over again, and the song is so fitting. It says, what the world needs now is love. Sweet love. That's the only thing that there's just too little of. What the world needs now is love, sweet love, not just for some, but for everyone. Lord, we don't need another mountain. There are mountains and hillsides enough to climb. There are oceans and rivers enough to cross, enough to last until the end of time. What the world needs now is love, sweet love. That's the only thing that there's just too little love. A tale of two loves. I look down at Brother George and I think, how in the world could I love that guy? And I've even got, I've got Scripture to go with it. Luke 18, 27 says, the things that are impossible with men are possible with God. I can love him. It's possible, I can do it. 2 Timothy 1.9 says, Who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ before the world began. I've got to start at the very beginning with love. Here it is. John 1, 1 through 4. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him. And without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life. And life was the light. Of men. That's a tale of his love. Let's stand together. Heavenly Father, thank you that you love us. Thank you that you show us every day how much you love us and all the things that you do for us constantly. Thank you, Father, that you loved us with a cross. And I pray, Lord Jesus, that if there's one here this morning that doesn't know you, that hasn't accepted your love, and that you haven't become their Lord and their Savior, that, Father, you would speak to their heart this morning. That can be done wherever they sit, Father, that they would just lift their heart to you and accept you. Father, if there's someone here who's hurting and just needs that loving touch from you, I ask you to touch them. I ask you to cover them in your love and in your peace. Whatever your will is, Father, may it be done. And I ask it in Jesus' name.